this morning, we get to talk and finish up our relationship series, and we're going to be talking about sex. Yay. Nobody said anything. No. Everybody held their breath. They're like, are we supposed to amen about sex in church? We're not sure. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to talk about it. And here's what we're going to do. If, if you have uh, somebody that's younger um, and, and you're really concerned about that, and, uh, you know, he's 25, but you haven't talked to him yet about this. So um, if you have, <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel silly at 830. If, if you do have somebody that's younger and you don't think it's appropriate, we're not going to be rude or crude. In fact, it was very, very done tastefully last night, our, our message. Uh, and you could just, they, they turn off the speakers in the lobby so you can send them out there and just, you know, hang out for the next 25 minutes or so. Uh, but we want to talk to you about this. And the title of the message is Pillow Talk. So uh, let's go to the scriptures uh, for us here. Let's stand as we read the word of God together. And we'll go here. And the Bible says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and what? Multiply. Come on, everybody say, be fruitful, be fruitful. and multiply. multiply. He says, fill the earth, govern it, uh, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground, right? So this is what he tells, uh, tells uh, this is what God tells them. And then in chapter 4, it says, now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, with the Lord's help, I have produced. I, that always, that's intriguing, with the Lord's help. What about Adam? Yeah. Adam had some help there too. Come on. Come on. But with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Verse 2, later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you. You can speak to all of us online and those, Lord God, here in Vegas and Orange County. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may uh, be seated. And, and the reason why we're going to talk about sex is because you are sitting here as a result of that. You know, sex impacts every area of the American culture, in fact, the world culture today. Um, marketers understand the power of sex. Uh, when I was growing up, um, I didn't watch hamburger commercials. Thank you, Carl's Jr., right? And, uh, and, and they weren't selling burgers with sex. Right. I mean, it's a sad day that I got to tell my son we're watching, and all of a sudden here's their advertising our natural burger. Come on. Yeah. Some of you haven't seen the commercial. Yeah. It's BJ, and he's like, like that. Uh, they sell cars with sex. They sell food with sex. They sell clothes with sex. Everything is about sex. Now, here's what I want to say about sex. Sex isn't dirty. No. Sex isn't wrong. Sex isn't bad. I'm not getting any amens. Amen. Okay, we talked to all of you. Let's try that again. Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> sex isn't dirty. Amen. Sex isn't bad. Amen. Sex isn't wrong. Amen. Okay? Uh, but, but what happens is when something gets perverted... What is perversion? You take the original intent right. and you change it and shift it, and now it gets perverted. Right. Sex isn't perversion, but you can have perverted sex. Right. Okay, so, so we need to understand this. So we want to just go from the Bible and just talk about this because I know that married people and unmarried people sitting here right now, that you are having sex. Now, when we start talking about this, you're not going to be condemned. You're not, oh, my goodness, they're looking at me. <laughs> so I'll just keep looking at my wife, all right? What I want you to do is I want you to hear what God's intent is, okay? So let's start with this. Number one, and you have a place to take notes. Number one, sex is sacred. Sex is a, is a sacred act. It's a sacred thing. That God himself in the very beginning, listen to this. He made man and woman, and he says, guys, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. The, the, the only way you could be fruitful and multiply is if you have sexual relations. So sex is a sacred thing. It's a holy thing. Come on, sex is a God thing. It, it is not, it's not created in the imaginations of men and women, but it is God himself who created both the man and the woman and says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Think about this. 
when God created Adam, right, Adam, what did he do? He gave Adam a job. Because as men, we get our identity from our job. job. So the men's summit is coming up. The men's conference is coming up. And don't worry, man. I'm not going to come up to you and say, how are you feeling? (laughs) Here's what we do as men. Hey, man, what's your name? My name is Bob. And if you know as you're a man, what's the next question you can ask Bob? What do you do? do? Now, if it's a women's thing, Wendy, how does that work with women? Just say, hi, how are you? How are you feeling? Well, I don't know. I just, I can't really explain how I'm feeling. It's just, it's so different. I don't know if it's like physical. I mean, I do feel a little bit bloated, but it could kind of be mental. And I'd be like, no, I totally understand that feeling. I have had that feeling myself. No, seriously, I think you look great. You look wonderful just the way you are. Do I? Thank you. You know what? I feel so much better now. Thank you for saying that to me. You're welcome. And all the women said, hey. Now, imagine if I say, hey, Pastor Henry, do you feel a little bit bloated? I mean, I don't know. I just thought I've got to watch Henry, and, and that's from the bad pizza. Henry says, I'm running. <laughs> but notice that even when God gave the man a job. By the way, ladies, don't date a man in, until he has a J-O-B. Uh, yeah, I said it. Don't give a man a D-A-T-E, a date. Until he has a J-O-B. Let me add something to that. If he asks you out and says you could pick me up. No. Don't date a man that doesn't have a J-O-B or a C-A-R. Because he's an L-O-S-E-R. Some joker coming to me want to date Bella. Bella, you pick me up. Shut up. Well, you're a pastor. I'm a ghetto pastor now. Get out of here. I'll jack you right now. Okay, let me get back to Seven Hills. So what you need to understand is the premise of this whole thing (laughs) is that sex is sacred. Sex is sacred. And, you know, there's very little that's sacred in our culture today. And even when we say the word sacred, for some of us, we kind of conjure up rituals or smoke or incense or, you know, the physical cross in the church or, you know, some kind of ritual. That's what we think of as sacred. And yet you look around this church and we, you know, you see ripped jeans and, 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 you know, and hats or whatever. And we think, oh, so it's kind of confusing. What is sacred? Well, this is not, it has nothing to do with ritual. It has nothing to do with doing something a certain way or smoke or, you know, um, special kinds of robes. It has everything to do with what God ordained. And God says, this is a sacred act meant to be done between a husband and a wife in the sacred in institution of marriage. So it's not as much as what's going on on the outside as what's going on on the inside. And that's always what Jesus did. Jesus always took it from outward appearance and he said it's always a part of the heart. So now we take the sacred from all the bells and the whistles of what religion says it is and we bring it to what Jesus says it is and it's a it's a place in our heart that is sacred. Marriage is sacred. Sex is sacred and it's holy unto God as well. Yeah, and so God created sex for enjoyment, for procreation, right? For mankind to connect in this act of, of, of sex. And, and, and I want to say it to you this way. Sex is sacred. It's not just a physical act. The world has made it just like, okay, just, 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 let's just get together and just have this sexual kind of like moment where God says, no, I want sex to be sacred and holy for a lifetime. And, and, and God, think about God that he would make it that sex would be enjoyable. That God said, I want you to have lots of sex because he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so understand the heartbeat of God and, and really the intention of God is that he wants us to enjoy this incredible experience but he wants us to understand that it is very sacred and it is a holy act. It's a holy thing. Can I hear an amen to that? So, so understand that the one who thought about it originated it. And the first thing that God commands both the husband and the wife, God gave a command to the man first, 
But when he has both of them together, the first thing he talks about them about is sex. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing when you start talking about that. And here's the crazy thing. It's usually the last thing his bride, his church talks about is sex. But it's the first thing God talked about is sex. So we're in Las Vegas. We might as well talk about it because people are doing it, whether you're married or unmarried. And we understand that. And my, our heart is to lay out what we believe the Bible is clear on. And then I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit, come on, is going to speak to everybody, right? And speak to people online to understand the significance of this incredible act, God act that is so sacred because number one, sex is sacred. Number two, Pastor Wendy. Number two, sex is significant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan will, won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Uh, this text is talking uh, about just the power of sex. And, you know, if you're sitting here today and you're feeling condemnation, number one, that's not from Jesus, okay? None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect in this room. That's the enemy trying to get you distracted so that you're not going to have ears to hear what we have to say. So we realize none of us are perfect. Some of you are first-generation Christians. You didn't even know that the Bible even talked about sex. There's no condemnation. The reason we're teaching this isn't so that you know, you can fall in line or that the enemy can beat you up or you can feel bad about yourself. But we have to think about our children and how we're raising our children, that we make sure even if we didn't do it perfect, that we are teaching them godly principles and really enabling them to do it God's way. Amen? Amen. So sex is significant. It's power. Sex is really a glue in a relationship for a husband and a wife. A, a man's needs are met physically, whereas, whereas a woman's needs are met emotionally. And the act of sex is where the two of those can be met at the same time. Uh, one of our pastors and now our dear friends and one of the elders, actually governing elders of the church movement, is Pastor Jude Fuquay. And uh, we would go to him. We were newly married, and Pastor Jude had been married uh, longer than and us and we are newly married we go oh pastor jude we're fighting so much we just can't stop fighting we're irritated at each other you know probably over something real stupid and he go oh just go have more sex <laughs> it was his answer for everything <laughs> oh just go have more sex now i am not here to say just go have more sex and it fixes every problem in your relationship <laughs> however <laughs> strike that from the record <laughs> However, there is something powerful about sometimes laying aside those differences and in the act of sex, in that intimacy, as your needs are being met physically and emotionally, and you kind of reattach, and there's a glue, there's an emotional fulfillment that happens in the act, and it, and it really does act as a glue sometimes. It's just a good reminder of that you love this person, you trust this person, you like being intimate with this person, you like being with this person, remembering why you got together in the first place. Because oftentimes, and there are big issues in marriage, and, and we encourage you to get some good Christian counseling if there's a major issue in your marriage. But some of those petty differences, they just cause division. And then we can start using sex as a means of manipulation or control. And God is really clear in this scripture. Listen, sex isn't about manipulation or control or withholding to try to get your way. In fact, it says you actually give control over your own body to your spouse. And it's a means of serving one another so so what the bible is teaching as pastor when he said is sex is now serving it's not about getting so uh as a husband i i serve my wife and and she serves me and 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 it's clear because you know paul has to deal with 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 this situation in his day and, and he says don't we help don't withhold that sex except to be for spiritual reasons of prayer 
And so don't, don't manipulate them. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do it because of this and that. So I have determined I'm not withholding sex from my wife. I am not going to manipulate her in that situation. I don't want to hurt you or do any of that. So I'm going to fulfill all righteousness in Jesus name. Now, how many of you know that that's usually not the way it goes? Right? And, and so, so and we, we laugh about it, but um, in my years of, of being married 16 years to this incredible woman and uh, even talking with married couples, it, it, is, it is a tragedy when it gets to that point. And then what happens is, is when you cut off that lifeline of sexual activity, it's amazing how the enemy comes in. And starts saying, oh, he understands you more. Oh, he's better for you. And then what happens emotionally, listen, this is, this is, for, this is the Holy Spirit because I feel this this strong. What happens emotionally will eventually happen physically. So, so outside of marriage, the sex that happens outside of marriage, and, and it's, it's called adultery or fornication. And uh, it happens in every church. It happens in life. It happens whether you're Christian or not. It always starts off emotionally. You get attached, right? And so somebody will say, oh, man, you're so incredible. I wish my husband was as understanding as you. And all of a sudden, like, whoa, I, oh, I'm understanding. Wow, that's great. And so what you don't understand is it, it, there's a hook being set. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay? And so, so Paul says, don't withhold it. Okay? So serve one another. Don't be demanding or demeaning but serve one another. Well, what would it look like for a husband and a wife to, to actually follow the scripture and in that context of the sacredness of sex and at that place of intimacy, you go into that moment with the idea of I'm going to serve my spouse and they come in, I'm going to serve my spouse and you go in, Serving each other. Yes. It is the greatest thing that you could do in that sacredness of sex. But if we're not careful, we allow other things outside of Scripture to influence us, and it's about getting. Yeah. It's about what I want. Right. What you're going to do for me. When I hear guys look at women and they go, look at that. You have just demeaned God's creation, a woman, to a thing. She is not a thing. She is not that. She's a woman. Okay? So, so it bothers me when I hear people and we just start looking at men or women as objects. Let me deal with human trafficking. Human trafficking, the way we stop sex trafficking, human trafficking, is not just by rescuing the women and the men and the children. If you stop the demand, the supply dries up. Because I have a degree in accounting. You business people, you know what I'm talking about, right? If the demand is not there, yeah. right? Yeah. So we need to start talking to men who are the number one propagators of the demand because we have, listen, if we're not careful, we have lost the sacredness of sex and we've turned it into a physical act to please me. It's all about me. And when you do it God's way, the blessing of God comes on your life and there's actually more fulfillment in serving than getting. That's a good place to clap right now. So, Pastor Wendy, so sex is, number one, it's sacred. sacred. Number two, it's significant, right? Yes. And, and Paul says, well, by the way, there's a lot of sexual immorality, so it's good that you, you, you have a husband, you have a wife, and because I don't want you to be tempted outside of that, but sex is also God's plan. It's God's plan. He has a way for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look what the scriptures are teach us here. He says, you say I am allowed to do anything. Now, let me give you a backdrop as we're reading this because I'm just throwing a scripture up to you. This is written to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a crazy church. It's a wild church. And when you, when you start reading the book of Corinthians, Paul says, oh, my goodness, things are happening in the church that even unbelievers don't do. That's what he's telling them. But you know what the crazy thing about this is Paul actually says to the saints that are at that Corinth. He actually calls them saints even though their behavior is not lining up with their identity. Because you cannot change somebody's behavior until you get them to understand their identity. So he's pointing them back to their identity. Because if you reaffirm your identity, sooner or later, right believing leads to right living. 
we, we got to get away from behavior modification in the church. It's like shock treat. Let's shock people enough, and then they'll start living right. No, the way you live right is you identify yourself as a son or daughter of God. You realize what Jesus has done. And so Paul says, you're all saints, even though you're acting crazy. I know some of us, religious thought is like, no, I'm only a saint when I act saintly. Then none of us qualify. Because we are not, watch me, redeemed by our actions. We're redeemed by the action of one. His name is Jesus. So, so he's writing to them because they're believing like, like stuff that's not true. He says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed, look, look at what he says, even though you're allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. So, so he goes, don't let your liberty become a license to become a slave. Third, verse 13, you say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual morality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. Keep that verse up, please, verse 13. Here is the argument. Paul is hearing these people say, come on, Paul. When you get hungry, don't you eat? Wow. That's what they're saying. I have natural hunger. I have natural desires. So if my stomach says I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. That's just part of what we do. So this is the argument Paul is arguing against. He says, absolutely, the stomach is made for food and the food meant for the stomach. But just because you follow your natural inclinations when it comes to your appetite for food doesn't mean you have to follow your natural inclinations for appetite when it comes to sex because Paul's going to make a huge argument here and this is God because God's using Paul to write this book verse 14 this is what he says and God will raise up from the dead by, uh, God will raise us up from from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead now look at this don't you realize that your bodies are actually come on parts of Christ should a man take his body which is part of Christ and join it to a prostitute he says, never, emphasis, obviously. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into what? One. Now, why is he saying this? Let me give you a backdrop again. You're Cor Corinth. In fact, Corinth was in ancient Las Vegas. Yeah. 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 I keep telling you this over and over again. They excavated a wall in Corinth. And on the wall engraved, it said, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. That's not true, but I always like to say that. Uh, so, so, so here's, if, you were, if we were Corinthians, and you have just come into, they actually called it the way, the movement, Christianity. Before you came into Christianity, you would actually now be a worshiper at the Temple of Aphrodite. Temple of Aphrodite was one of the seven wonders of the world. She is the goddess of sex. And when you would go, part of their worship is you would sing some songs and then you would have sex. They had 1,000 temple prostitutes. That part of your worship was you would go into those temple prostitutes every week. And now that was part of the sexual uh, worship towards this goddess. And so now they're coming out of that and that thinking. And so they're just saying, hey, that's what I've always done. Man, I have urges, I have desires, I just go, and just like I'm eating, now I'm having sex. But then Paul makes the argument, notice what he says. He doesn't say, you shouldn't have those desires. Those desires are evil. Those desires are bad. He never says any of that. In fact, he never attacks, undermines, or somehow gets the people to think that their desires are not God-given. What he decides to do is to say, I'm not going to address the desire. I'm going to address the vessel. You now go to a temple to worship. But I'm going to flip this upside down and say, no longer do we go to a building to worship because now you are the temple. Your body is the temple. He says, he says so, so now I want you to picture yourself as a part of Christ's body. And Christ, you want to join him to a prostitute. But the one who is joined to the Lord, look at this verse, is one spirit with him. Run. What does the Bible say? Run. It didn't say, well, let me, let me check this thing out. <laughs> it says run from what? Sexual sin. 
No other sin is so, so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual morality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the what? Temple. Say it louder. Is the what? Temple of the what? Holy yeah. And where does the Holy Spirit live? In me. Now, I want you to say that. In me. In me. Say, in me. in me. The Holy Spirit lives in Benny Perez. Holy Spirit lives in Debbie Whittington. If you're a follower of Jesus, well, I'm not that good of a follower. Didn't say that. If you're a follower of Jesus, come on. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Well, I wasn't that good of a follower this week. He didn't leave you. He's still there. Who lives in you and was given, not earned. To you by God. And because of that, you don't belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. What was the high price? Was His son Jesus. What did he do? Died. He on died the cross. on the cross. We talked about that last week. And he bought you. He redeemed you. He paid the highest price for you. So now, now watch. Here is the gospel. But if you don't hear anything, hear this. Religion teaches you do, do, do so that you can get God's affection and, and, and acceptance. The whole argument, in, especially in the Pauline epistles, is that Paul is always saying, let me tell you what God has done, 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 done. I want to show you all that Jesus has done for you. And when you see how magnificent Jesus is, you are naturally going to respond yeah. to what he has done. So the response wow. to God redeeming you, buying you, yes. filling you with the Spirit, Amen. loving you unconditionally no matter what, is this. Honor God with your body. Amen. Honor God with your body. Amen. Talk about you were not made for sexual sin, he says. You were never says. made for sexual sin. You were made, your body, uh, your mind, your emotions yep. were made to do it God's way. And, you know, we really have to challenge the culture and popular thought. And, and we have to be careful. We have become so ingrained with culture like, well, they just need to sow their wild oats. Well, I just want them to see what the world is like before they settle down for marriage. Well, you got to kick the tires before you buy the car. I mean, think about all the things that culture says, and you were not careful, we'll find ourselves repeating those things and just allowing those mindsets and those seeds to just kind of be placed in our heart and in our minds. And really, that is never the way that God intended for it to be. And I love the scripture that says, run from it. You know, because we talk a lot about, uh, we talk a lot about grace. Well, isn't there grace? Isn't there grace? There is grace. But let me tell you what grace is. Grace is the ability to do the will of God. Grace is the power to obey. That's what I always make my kids repeat to me. That means grace doesn't just come in afterwards and help you when you mess up. Grace is actually the power to say, oh, my goodness, here I am. I don't want to be here. I, I feel like I'm going to do this sin again or get caught in this again. I'm going to turn and run. Grace is the ability to turn yourself around and run away. Remove yourself from those circumstances. If you have an issue in that, change that internet password. Get somebody that knows that, that is trustworthy, that you can say, hey, I'm really struggling in this area. Would you keep me accountable? And it can't be someone that's necessarily struggling with the same thing because then you'll both be like, oh, I did it again. Oh, I did it again too. Oh, man, you know. <laughs> you need someone that, you know, is, is a little bit, is a little bit mean and you know it's just really going to keep you accountable that you might be a little bit embarrassed to have to tell get that person in your life and say listen i'm struggling with this i'm not saying tell the whole prayer group or tell your whole group or tell everybody and don't put it on facebook yeah don't but you know get get a good uh, partner yep. to help you in that that is really going to keep you accountable and then don't put yourself in those circumstances if you know that area of town or or that party or that group of friends remove yourself the bible is clearly saying yep. run from those things turn the other way and it might be for a season of your life but you know what it's more about you than it is about them and you know what? They might laugh and they might think that's funny or that's silly or why are you doing it that way? Or, oh, my gosh, you're so prude. But, you know, I bet deep down in them that they're, they're probably really impressed and have a lot of respect for those decisions that you're making. So just be empowered 
by the grace of God to make those good decisions. So let me give you a scripture. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> That's the book of Hezekiah, chapter 3, verse 1. Okay. So just run. Just run from that. Run from that. Oh, pastor. One, one young person, young man came to me. He goes, pastor, pray. Pray that God would take away my sexual urges. I said, nah. It's not a good prayer. You don't want that. You're going to need those. So, so, so here, here's what you need to do, and I just, I like to illustrate it this way. The way you break the power of an addiction or sin isn't to obsess over it. Okay, it's like, oh my, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh, I keep, Lord, I, I. Here's what you do. The Bible says it, says it this way, turn your, turn your eyes to Jesus. So what happens when, watch, look at this very simple illustration. Say I'm struggling with porn. I'm struggling with sex outside of marriage, whatever it is. You could obsess and keep beating yourself up, or this is my issue, and instead of focusing on my issue, I take my issue, and I turn my back on my issue, but I naturally turn my back on that thing when I face and I look towards Jesus. The more I look towards Jesus and behold Jesus, come on, the more he gives me my identity. Amen. Let me tell you when you need to do this the most, when you've blown it. Immediately you need to turn and say, no, Lord, I just look to you right now. You say, well, that's counterintuitive. It is because the enemy wants you to go religious and beat yourself and do all that. I'm telling you, we got to get back to the Bible. That, 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 that God says that through Christ we reign in life and we break the power of sin because Jesus has broken the power of sin over our life. Can I hear an amen to that? So, so, so Paul says this, sex outside of marriage is going to produce all kinds of consequences that are not good. God's not saying don't have sex because it doesn't feel good. He created, he says it, it's great, it's awesome, but it's like a river. A river, as long as it stays within its banks, produces incredible stuff. You can irrigate, you could swim in it, it's a big river, you could boat in it, it's wonderful. But when a river goes outside of its banks, it becomes a flood. And now that same water that was bringing life brings destruction, right? I don't know any flood, any flood anywhere that is like, wow, we're grateful for this flood. Never. It ruins houses, ruins crops, ruins land, ruins everything. So, so God is saying, hey, I created this. Keep it within the boundaries. Keep it within the boundaries. One, one person said this, well, I... I'm practicing safe sex. Oh, okay. I use protection. I say, that's all good. But let me tell you about your safe sex. It may protect a part of your anatomy, but that, whatever you're using, cannot protect your heart. Yeah. Cannot protect your heart. Wow. Now, here's what happens. Young ladies, young men, you'll get to the point where it doesn't matter anymore, and it becomes a sexual act. Friends, that's not the way you're wired. What God wired you to serve and to receive. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so, so there's a lot of, con let's, we could get real, just, just common sense, STDs, spiritually transmitted diseases. Because when you have sex outside of marriage, you join yourself to that person. STDs, regularly sexually transmitted diseases. And I'm not just talking about AIDS, I'm talking about gonorrhea. I'm talking about all the other things that are out there. Well, I take an antibiotic, but friends, if you do it God's way, you don't have to deal with all those consequences. Right. Let me deal with a lot of us that have had sex before we've gotten married. First of all, that is under the blood. Right. You say, well, Pastor, I, I got to be honest with you, man. I, geez, I'm, still, I'm still doing that right now. I'm, I mean, Pastor, you know, come on, I'm single. I understand that, but let today be the day that you say, you know, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to start fresh and anew with no condemnation because I'm going to trust God in this. Let me, let me wrap this up um, because we could keep talking about this. And, I, and how many of you think it's been done tastefully? It's been doing okay, right? Just, just going to the scripture. Um, oftentimes in marriage conferences or uh, just even talking to people, you know, pastor, I'm a married man and, you know, and and I have a wife, and it's all, well, you know, what, what are the parameters in marriage? I mean, what's, what's good, what isn't good, you know? My wife or my husband doesn't want to do this or do that. Let me just give you some broad parameters. 
number one, I, I don't think it's biblical that you bring any kind of video, uh, other couples on screen to spice up your marriage, a.k.a. pornography. Now, I subscribe to magazines, and now they're promoting these therapeutic videos. Friends, pornography, both secular and Christian psychologists are saying, will destroy your relationship. It does not enhance anything. It corrupts and messes up your mind and your heart. And in fact, Pastor Wendy, the shocking statistic now, the fastest growing segment in pornography today in America is young women. They're, being, they're just being sucked in starting at the age of 14. They, these are the real facts. So number one, you don't need to bring any videos in and start comparing. Number two, I would just tell you this, that if, if any of your, the spouses feel demeaned or demanded or feeling less than, whatever you are talking about in the context of that marriage sexual encounter, I would tell you I don't believe that's something that you should be doing because that's not serving one another. Right. That's demanding one another. Right, right. And the last parameter I would just give, and, and, and I think that you need to have as, as people in the context of God that is sex is sacred, it's significant, it's for marriage, I think you need to have uh, frequent sex. I think you need to have a, a lot of sex. Now, what is a lot? That's up for debate, okay? Uh, if you talk to men, the, 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 some, yeah, Pastor Paul is like, yeah, you know. Uh, but here's what I would say. Free, well, he's yelling. I'm gonna, if he's going to yell, I'm going to point him out. Uh, he hasn't yelled any time else except when I said frequency of sex. So, you know, uh, so, hey, it's all good, you know. Pastor Paul, it doesn't end after 60. Hey, Amen. It just is like, wow. Uh, or 70 or 80. I don't know what it is. Here's my point. I think it should be frequent enough to keep that bond strong. I think it should be frequent enough that you know what? That it fulfills the needs of both parties. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. And I, I want to encourage us, you know, let's be examples. Let's set, listen, married sex is the best kind of sex on the planet. Because you, you know what I hear? People are like, oh, you're married. Boring. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Once I get done with, you know, my stuff, then I'll finally settle down. Because I don't know where they thought that married sex is boring sex. Because that's not God's plan. No. I end with the story. I'm a basketball fan. And back in the day, I used to play actually pretty good. Um, and uh, used to always, always just school, you know. And I'm, I'm 21, and I'm playing with the best of I'm schooling those middle school girls. They couldn't keep up with me. <laughs> I mean, it was just amazing, posting them up, phenomenal, just incredible. <laughs> so after I finished dominating both middle school girls and, and guys playing that basketball, uh, I, I love sports. And one of, my, one of the guys that was the most prolific scorer probably in the history of the NBA was a guy named Wilt Chamberlain. He was before my time, but I saw videos. They called him the Big Dipper as he would just literally lay the ball up like that. He scored 100 points in one game. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, Will Chamberlain actually has an autobiography. In his autobiography, I end with this story. He said, you know, I, I had a insatiable appetite for women. And he has claimed, and many could back up his story, that he has slept with 50,000 women in his lifetime. He's, he's not alive anymore. And people, oh, my gosh, 50,000 women. Yeah, and, and, and uh, that was probably true because he loved women. And he liked women, and he, he just wanted to be with as many women as possible. But it's so funny because... As you read his autobiography, he goes on to say, though, you know, even though I slept with 50,000 women, I found out something. I wish I would have found one woman and slept with her 50,000 times. What Will Chamberlain is telling us that he tried it the other way and found no fulfillment. And at the end of his life, he wanted that one woman that he could be with 50,000 times. Guess what? God said it all the way in Genesis. It's time to live it. Come on in the year 2015.